listening to episode 60 of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Josh Havens. And I'm Chris Lamberth. And we're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us and hope that as you set aside this time for God, that he would help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. Today, we are privileged to talk with Dennis Ockholm. Dennis is professor of theology at Azusa Pacific University and adjunct professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He speaks frequently in church and youth group settings and is a canon theologian for the Diocese of Churches for the sake of others. Ockholm is the author or editor of many books, including Dangerous Passions, Deadly Sins, and Monk Habits for Everyday People. His latest book, Learning Theology Through the Church's Worship, shows the inseparable connection between what the church believes and what the church does as a worshiping community. Theology. Many Christians flinch a little when they hear that word. We live in an era where theology has become a dirty word, associated with stiff academics and argumentative dogmatists. But theology is at the core of who we are as disciples. If we are genuine in our faith, theology is unavoidable because we naturally ask questions about who God is and how we should follow him. So we must work to make sure our theology is done well, rooted in the history of the church that seeks to worship God. And that's the approach Dennis Ockholm takes in his book, Learning Theology Through the Church's Worship. The way we live our life in Christ displays our theology, just as our theological beliefs influence the way we worship God in our everyday life. And so theology forms a core discipline that we as disciples cannot ignore. Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Really excited to be talking with you today about your book, Learning Theology Through the Church's Worship. Uh, I was mentioning before how I'd originally gotten introduced to your work through another book that you had done, Dangerous Passions, Deadly Sins, and that one was all about early church fathers and uh, you know the early m- monastics, and that book had a real impact on on my life, and it, it still is having an impact. I'm still trying to work through uh, many of the 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 concepts and ideas that I thought I had right and had very wrong, and, and you're sort of pointing out some of these things that, that are really good. But I'm really excited to be talking to you today about then uh, you, you know, theology. Theology is one of those areas that's really integral to the Christian's life, and yet we in today's culture and in our church world are afraid of it. It seems like nobody wants to touch theology, and in fact, there are some groups that, you know, try to push it away, and unfortunately, they demonstrate a theology there. But um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, but I think that it's one of those key things that we need to discuss in order to um, grow in our walk with Christ. Cause if, but, but anyway, before I get ahead of myself, let's just, why did you write this book? What led you to write it? Great question. Um, I've been teaching uh, theology, um, which is simply studying God. Um, and, and I get paid for it, which is amazing. Um, I've been teaching theology in university and college for, well, this will be my 39th year coming up. Um, And years ago, uh, several years ago, I was introduced to a book by uh, Jeffrey Wainwright. Uh, He is from Duke University and wrote a book called Doxology. And what he was doing was showing the integration of theology with our worship. And I should add that uh, worship today is often referred to as just the music in the service, but worship really is everything that we're doing, the prayers, the sermons, um, all of that. And I I found that fascinating because I hadn't read a theology book that really brought together our our worship and our thinking about God. But that book was way high above everyone's pay grade. All of my students uh, had a hard time understanding it. And so I thought I should write one that would be uh, usable in churches and in colleges um, uh, to help people to see the integration of how we think about God and our worship of God. Um, And it also uh, bounces off of something that I once read in the theology of Karl Barth, the great 20th century Protestant theologian, who uh, said at one point um, that we should not just simply talk about God uh, without talking to God. And I think what happens a lot of times with theology, and maybe why some people are turned off, is because we're just talking about God. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so my book tries to bring together um, the talking about God with the fact that we're doing this in the presence of God. And so we're, we're also listening to God and talking to God as we do our theology. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. Um, we have divorced theology from our day-to-day uh, life, and, and so we, we kind of lose how it impacts our day-to-day life. I remember in college when I first getting uh, went to Bible college and getting exposed to a lot of these, uh, these ideas for the first time, and, and, and you, you break this down in the book, so um, for those who want to pick it up and read it, this will also be funny. Um, I remember getting introduced to the study of practical theology, <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, why is there such a thing as practical theology? Shouldn't your theology be practical? Like, is there, does that mean there's an impractical theology? <laughs> anyway, but that's how it comes. It, practical theology is a formal study, by the way. So once you sort of learn these things, you know, you, yeah. uh, you there is a distinction. Th- there is a distinction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there is, we, the way in which we talk about theology is often it it does it seems so incredible it seems like it's an impractical thing because it's just it's um you well you pointed out right it, we're just studying god like we put him under the microscope mm-hmm. we put him at hand's length and we say okay well what can we know or think about uh this guy how did we get to a place where that's that's our uh, our perception or that's what theology has become is where we just we want to put god under a microscope and study him rather than like you just mentioned um, talking to God or doing theology in his presence? That's a good question. I, I think part of it is due to the fact that um, especially, and this gets into too much uh, uh, church history, we don't want to do too much of it here, but um, there is a situation in which the 19th century, uh, a lot of theology became academic, university oriented, and got wrenched out of the church. Um, there's actually a a great book called By the Renewing of Our Minds by Ellen Chari, who argues that um, theology was always thought of, thought of as teaching us how to live wisely. But then, especially when we got into the 19th century, um, it became more university oriented. And, and, I, and I fault a lot of the church for that reason, too, because I think the church kind of pulled back, especially in our evangelical culture. And um, just focused on the emotional aspects of our um, relationship with God, our worship of God, uh, without thinking about the fact that we should worship God with our minds as well. And so the church hasn't always recently, at least, done the best job of what we call catechesis, that is teaching people what the faith is. And uh, I would argue that, in fact, that's part of the, um, the point of the book. If you get your theology, if you get your thinking about God wrong, then everything else about your life is going to be wrong in terms of your thinking about how to live, uh, how to be with others, and so forth. Um, For instance, just to give you an example, um, the book, uh, while it teaches uh, doctrine in in the context of worship, um, is going through the doctrine of the Trinity, um, which is foundational to our faith. And if we don't understand that God is uh, eternally a Father, Son, Holy Spirit in a, an eternal love relationship, um, then we won't understand, I think, as well as we should, that made in the image of that God means that to be fully human in that image, we need to be in good relationships with each other, that, um, that image the God who is in this eternal love relationship. So that's the, as you were bringing out, the practicality of, of this um, kind of heavy-headed theology that we have. It, it really shouldn't stay up in the clouds. It really should kind of filter down. One of the things I try to do in the book is uh, when I deal with heresies, um, which are important to know about, um, I try to show the practical implications of those. Um, one, one person wrote a book called The Cruelty of Heresy, and if we get our thinking about God wrong on, the, on some of those issues, it can hurt our lives. Um, for instance, mm. if, um, if people want to read the book and learn about what Arianism is, if they don't know what that is, a heresy that came about during the, the debates about the Trinity in the fourth century, especially, um, you, might lead, you might be led to a life of legalism. And um, that's the practical outworking of that. In other words, I'll try to be really good so that I can be called a son and daughter of God. Yeah. 
And legalism will hurt you. Um, it might even give you ulcers. So, uh, <laughs> so there are practical implications of all of this theology, and um, it's one of the reasons that we should be learning it. So I think the church needs to recapture. Um, I mean, that was that was kind of the uh, implication of your question. The church needs to recapture what is significant about theology for our everyday lives. And when you find yeah. that out, it's really exciting. Does, does part of this come from the rise of deism and maybe the Great Enlightenment, where we look at God as very separate, very distant, and not so much imminent and involved in our lives day to day? I think that's exactly part of it, yeah. And especially in our um, American culture, our U.S. history, deism has been pretty rife. In fact, um, you guys probably know the study that was done of adolescent um, faith, and they found that it was moralistic, therapeutic deism. Um, it wasn't really... Uh, vibrant Christianity that's rooted in the God revealed in Christ. And right there, again, you've got theology. Who is this God? Yeah. This God is the God who is revealed definitively in Jesus Christ. Well, then I've got to know who Jesus is, and I want to be as accurate as I can about that. Mm-hmm. Well, so that's a good that's a good point. So what's the difference between that, like this moralistic deism, because, um, and then what you just said is like true Christianity, because... If we're all good American Christians, tongue in cheek here, we'll, we'll, we'll dissect it. I'm sure. Um, isn't that really the goal, right? I mean, we've been founded on uh, Judeo-Christian principles, and so isn't the goal just to live a good life and you know follow the Ten Commandments? If they're up in the courthouses, we're all Christians and we're good to go. Like, so what's that difference? Yeah, big difference. Um, uh, <sighs> I th- th- one of the huge problems with that is that um, when we go that route that you're speaking of, we tend to give a definition to who God is on our own. Um, we conceive of God in, in kind of a tribal image, if you will. Sometimes it's a national image. Um, and that's why, and I emphasize this in the book, that's why we have to constantly go back to the notion that, no, this God is a God who clearly defined who this God is. And that was done not only in Scripture, but especially in Jesus Christ. And um, when you look at Christ as the definition of who God is, sometimes that goes against our pre- our conceptions of who God is in that kind of deistic um, uh, way. I mean, talking about the Ten Commandments on the wall, those are ripped out of the context of the covenant that God made with Israel. Um, and when you take those out of the covenantal context, uh, which is, again, something that's brought up in the book, when you take things like that out of the covenantal context, then they just become rules. They were never meant to be just rules. They were meant to uh, be, this is the way that covenant people uh, know how to be healthy in their life with each other and with God. Um, so it, uh, I think the Ten Commandments takes on an incredible dynamic. Um, there's a um, chapter in the book on um, what we call sanctification, which is part of our salvation, becoming more holy. And when I'm explaining John Calvin's idea of sanctification, I bring up the idea that he, um, uh, he, he taught that the Ten Commandments are simply ways in which um, covenant people of the covenant l- learn to live together. In fact, Karl Barth, the theologian I mentioned from the 20th century, um, called those commandments permissions. Um, Thou shalt not kill means I have permission to protect life. Um, and so they don't just become rules anymore. They become um, a description of the kind of life that we Jesus type people live our lives. Yeah. And that's uh that's that goes for the entire uh, Pentateuch, right? Or, or the mm-hmm. the Torah. It, it if we look at it in this way of instruction, um, it changes the entire way that we sort of approach the text, and we we kind of start taking on a, a more Hebrew mindset and to try to read it through the eyes of the uh, the original audience, rather than just look at it as you know simply a law code that dictates the way that I. You know, it's like, okay, you know, uh, Leviticus chapter 18 verse, you know, okay, this, this must, and and that's where we get into all these arguments. And I'm bringing this up because again, I think this is a really important distinction to learn is, is to why biblical studies and why theology is so important for the everyday, uh, Christian, the people who are listening to this podcast are, you know, by and large, not scholars, um, you know, definitely leaders in their churches, some pastors. Um, but I know even then there's still many people question the validity 
until they really run up against some of these problems and maybe mm-hmm. their parishioners should come to them and they they say, you know, well, like, yeah, that's true. Like, why why does it matter if the Ten Commandments are up on the back of the, you know, the courtrooms or whatnot? And so we can we can start to sort of work through these things uh, theologically from a biblical perspective. One of the th- other things is I'm hearing you talk, and I know this is another um, – this is an area where – people who study theology are cursed with knowledge (laughs) is we throw around all these terms, right? And we're going to talk about postmodernism here in a little bit. Um, Does, I want to ask about like, is the language of theology important to learn when we, you know, are going through this uh, routine or can people just learn like the concepts and we sort of just like, why do you have to say Arianism, for instance? Why can't you just say, oh, you know, that belief where uh, Jesus really wasn't uh, God or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I, I, I do think we could live with a, just the concepts. The nice thing about language, uh, learning vocabulary theologically, is that it becomes kind of a shortcut for. So when I say Arianism to a person who knows what Arianism is, um, I've just uh, for them um, uh, compacted a whole paragraph in one word. And we don't need to explain what the concept yeah. is. So part of, I, I tell my students this, learning any discipline, whether it's psychology or medicine or theology, uh, is learning a language. And the language just helps us to kind of shortcut into concepts that, um, that take more than just one word to, to explain. So, um, so it's just helpful, I, to, you know, to be uh, helpful to people that uh, aren't as schooled in these things. Uh, they shouldn't be discouraged if all of this is new to them. Um, I, I, again, I tell my students, I had to learn this stuff three or four or five times in, in the college and graduate school and then teach it about three or four times before I really understood it and got it down and um, mm-hmm. got it into my head. But isn't that the way it is with anything? I mean, if I want to be a good concert pianist, I have to really work at that. Um, I have to learn concepts. Um, I'm taking advantage of this uh, COVID time to learn some music theory. And I learned about the circle of eights and um, people that don't learn music theory don't know about that. Well, it just got me excited because now I was learning a concept that um, I can just simply talk about in terms of circle of eight. Um, and, and the same thing is with theology. I think uh, we can get pretty excited about, oh, okay, that's, that's what that is. You know, I had a, I had a kind of an idea that that was wrong, but now I know why it's wrong. Um, I mean, Athanasius, who did argue against Arius in the fourth century, we owe him a huge uh, deal of credit because um, he helped us to understand that we need to say that the son is the same God as God, the father, different person, but the same God, because if they're not, as he explained it, our salvation is at stake. If the Son is not the one who also created us along with the Father, then we are not recreated, we are not redeemed, um, because he has neither the power nor the authority to, um, to, to be that kind of God. So um, yeah, we, owe, we owe these theologians who come before us a great debt. And, and so some of learning the language and learning some of the names is just a way of appreciating that. In the same way that I would argue that people in the United States learn American history, U.S. history. And they learn concepts, they learn vocabulary, they learn names, and they become well-versed in it to become good citizens. So part of what I argue in the book is that we need to learn these things. We even have, even have a church calendar um, that many Christians don't know about. They, they're more familiar with the American calendar, U.S. calendar, than the church calendar, except for Christmas and Easter. That's about mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah. Once you learn some of these names um, and you celebrate one of these great Christians feast days, um, just as we celebrate, we observe Martin Luther King Jr. Day, President's Day, which used to be Washington and Lincoln's. Then you realize, hey, I, we have a calendar too. And um, that's training us to see the world in a way that's Christian. And if I, and this is a huge issue at the beginning of the book, if I can learn to see the world Christianly, then I can act in the world Christianly. Mm -hmm. We only act in a world that we see. Um, So if I see somebody rummaging around in a trash can as made in the image of God for whom Jesus Christ died, I will act toward that person differently than if I simply see that person as a welfare bum who needs to get a job. And so um, part of learning theology is helping me to see the world Christianly so that I can act in the world Christianly. 
That's a lot of what goes on there. And that's where the worship comes in, too, because our liturgy, our worship, is teaching us to see the world a certain way. It, we may not even realize that, but I don't care what kind of church we're in, whether it's uh, Pentecostal, uh, Baptist, um, Presbyterian, Anglican. When we're in a church worship service, uh, we are being trained to see the world a certain way. And when we walk out the doors of that church building, um, we will act in the world um, the way that we were trained to see it. So again, that's why it's so important to get the theology and the worship together. Yeah, I think so often we look at our Christian life as so individualistic. It's really just about us getting the eternal reward or us changing our own lives, and we forget that we've really bought into a heritage, a community. We've committed ourselves to not just our own life, but the lives of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And that comes along with learning the new things that are part of becoming part of a new family. And it's if we miss that, I think it really does affect our our day to day theology because we're literally saying, "I'm not concerned with the rest of the the community of the kingdom of God in this case. I'm only concerned about my own life, which is in and of itself a way of looking at the world that I would argue is not Christian, <laughs> like you're mm-hmm. like you're trying to say here. The we need to think Christianly, and I think thinking Christianly means thinking about the the heritage that we've become part of as well. Yeah. Oh, that's so well said. Um, you know, that's, um, again, there's a chapter on baptism and communion and, and baptism is not just being baptized into the life, death and resurrection of Christ, but it's also being immersed into a new fellowship of people, um, who have also been baptized. And, um, one of the things we can't do alone is, is live Christianly, right? Um, somebody said, Two things you can't do in life alone are uh, be married and be a Christian. So uh, <laughs> um, we actually have to have and 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 impl- implied in what you're saying is the fact that um, part of that communion are people whose rest has been won, as that great hymn, "The Church Is One Foundation," puts it. We we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Athanasius, for Luther, for uh, Hildegard, and all these other yeah. people come before us and handed the faith faithfully on down to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, my wife, I, I hang around Benedict and monks. And um, so we like a guy named Benedict from the uh, fifth century Mm -hmm. century. And uh, we, uh, he has a feast day, a a celebration day, like Martin Luther King Jr. has a day. Um, His day is July 11th. um, And we celebrate, we, we have steak for dinner, you know? And (laughs) (laughs) so, um, why? Because he's made an impact in my life, uh, just as people like Augustine and Calvin and others have. So, um, yeah. Do you think we've done a disservice in the way that we preach the gospel then that it, it, it seems like we invite people into, uh, well, not a story. We're not inviting people into a story, mm-hmm. into a community. We're just preaching the invite Jesus into your heart so you can get saved but it feels like we're missing then this, uh, you know, all of this stuff. So how, and, and this is a problem that I'm really trying to uh, wrestle with as well myself is, is my own thinking on this gets turned and changed. I'm, I'm starting to struggle with like, okay, well, I've got 66 books of the Bible to pack into, you know, uh, a two minute gospel presentation. How does this work? You know, and then, you know, 2000 years of church history that I would like to, and, and so I'm struggling with that. How do you think about, you know, going about presenting the gospels in in, in a way that we can faithfully call people um, into this community so that they can, I think, accurately count the cost before they commit? Wow, that is a that's a great question. Um, First of all, I I think the best way to encourage people to consider the gospel is just that we live out. something like the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, right? People will see, hey, this community of people is living a different kind of life, uh, the way that they reconcile with each other and the way they treat each other. Um, and they might ask about that. I, I just read a few months ago a wonderful book called uh, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church by a guy named Kreider. And he was actually arguing that in the early church, and by that he means the first uh, four centuries, 
they were not in a hurry to get people into the church. They first wanted them to know exactly what they were getting themselves into. So they might take um, with a sponsor, a Christian sponsor, uh, might present this person to the church and say, this guy is really interested in what we're about. And the church would say, all right, well, then let's teach him what we're about. And if he buys into it, so to speak, um, he'll be baptized and be part of the fellowship. Um, sometimes that would take two years um, simply because uh, they wanted to be sure that people were serious about this Christian life. And I think if we're not, uh, we've trivialized what Jesus is about. Um, and we, we just can't afford to do that, especially now with everything that's going on. We need to really be serious about our, our faith. So, um, yeah, so a lot of that has to do, I think, with just inviting people to come along. I mean, you know, the Greek commission, the, the Greek uh, should be translated um, in your going, mm -hmm. make disciples. Yeah. Right? Um, as you're going along day to day, make disciples. And it doesn't say make decisions. You make disciples and those are followers. And then you do it, Jesus said, and this again is the Greek construction, by baptizing them. In other words, immersing them into this life with Christ and the fellowship of believers and then teaching them everything that I taught you. That's that should be our goal. And again, we're right back to theology, aren't we? Because theology has a lot to do with what Jesus taught us. And as the church reflected on that over the years. And so that's that's what we're to be about, making disciples, not this, not just decisions, um, you know, not just notches on the belt. So, so yeah. to speak. No, and that's a, that's a really important, uh, distinct year. I've asked several guests now, some sort of form of, of that question. And you guys are all kind of hitting on this, this, this same theme, right? Is it's not number one, the responsibility isn't with me. And mm -hmm. if I am being faithful and living my life out, uh, according to as a good citizen of the kingdom of God, um, mm -hmm. that becomes attractive. And then again, I don't need to be in a hurry. We in our Western American context, we're in a hurry to do everything right. Uh, we want the BK gospel and have it your way, and you know, uh, <laughs> over ten billion served or whatever McDonald's is now. Anyway, <laughs> and um, it it we feel that all that responsibility is on us. But what you're talking about here is a theology that says no, your call is to be faithful to your journey, and as you're walking that, that journey out, whatever, wherever that is that, that God has called you, make disciples in your context, in your area. And uh, I, I think that's a—again, I've asked several people this, and I keep forgetting it. <laughs> it's one of those lessons, yeah. apparently, I just need to continue to, uh, to learn and relearn and, and, and relearn. Yeah. And, that's and, why I really like the way Paul Borthwick said it a few weeks ago. He said, we are, we are witnesses— in God's case that he's building to win over the lives of those around us. Mm -hmm. So God's working on these things. I mean, you, we, we talked about first Corinthians three in that conversation with Paul and uh, Paul, uh, Paul planted Apollo watered. God brought the growth. And here we are thinking we have to get decisions in the moment when we're talking yeah. with people. And really God's been doing a work in their life and will continue doing a work in their life after we're gone. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. called to be a witness in that moment and be faithful to whatever it is God's put in front of us to to do in that moment, not yeah. necessarily to get the decision. Yeah. And that's part of this, really it's part of the lifestyle of discipleship that we're trying to, to help people build here is faithfulness in those everyday moments mm -hmm. because this is about the long game, not the immediate short game decision stuff that we like to get so wrapped up in. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I want to talk about that. It leads really well into this idea of a liturgy. Um, you know, it's, it's a big part of, of, of worship. It's a big part of, uh, you talk about it in your book. Um, but it's also, and, and you point this out and people like James K.A. Smith have been, uh, really critical in pointing this out that we have a liturgy of life. Like it, it becomes part of our everyday life. It's not just, um, for those people who go to, you know, high church services and stuff like that. So for, for, let, let, let's define our terms real quick. So for people who don't, know what liturgy is or aren't familiar with it. Um, what do we mean when we talk about liturgy? And maybe we can start with the church and then expand that to yeah, the way great. it plays into the rest of our life. Great. And by the way, James K. Smith, um, it comes, his, you can hear his voice kind of in the first uh, couple of chapters, especially the first chapter of the, of my book. Um, yeah. So liturgy, oftentimes people define that um, as work done by the people. Um, Liturgia, but um, 
there's been some etymological work done on it, and I point this out in the book, that it really uh, etymologically means work done on behalf of the people. And so um, in that sense, what we're doing is we are participating in the, the son's communion with the father. Um, the Holy Spirit is allowing us to participate in the son's communion with the father. So we are actually, so liturgy ultimately is, um, involves our communion with this triune God um, and, uh, and becomes an expression of that. Um, we express it in words, in song, in artwork, uh, all different kinds of ways. Um, so it's, um, it's work that we participate in, but work done on behalf of us. There's a, a verse in, in Hebrews uh, where uh, it says Jesus Christ is our liturgy. Um, Jesus Christ is the one who is um, doing this on behalf of us, and then we get to join him. I think of it this way. There's kind of a party going on upstairs, so to speak, and we get invited up um, to join this party. And so we, we celebrate that uh, in our worship services. Um, where we, we hear the word of God, we respond to the word of God, we, we sing, we pray, uh, we hear testimony, um, all different kinds of ways in the liturgy. This goes way back in the early church. Um, actually, it goes back in the Old Testament. You know, we were talking about um, Ten Commandments and all of that. The book of Leviticus is all about the combination of liturgy and theology. So uh, the church inherited that in the New Testament, and then live that out. Um, so, uh, so we've inherited even kinds of orders. You know, uh, there's an order of liturgy that has been passed on through the centuries. Some churches, uh, some denominations um, try to replicate that or, or use it. Um, other churches have become much more contemporaneous, but I would argue that they too have a liturgy. Just try to change something some Sunday and <laughs> say, wait a minute, we don't do it that way. Um, so we, we get into that kind of a, um, a routine. So the liturgy, and you mentioned Smith, um, and this goes back to a, something we were talking about earlier. The liturgy does shape the way that uh, we think about things, the way that we see things. And, um, uh, you know, he uses, and I use in the book also, um, the example of, of U.S. liturgy. Um, we have um, liturgical colors, red, white, and blue. Uh, we have um, saints. King, others. Um, we have um, scripture, which is the Constitution that always is talked about, and the, the Declaration of Independence. We have um, sanctuaries, so to speak, um, whether it's the, the Capitol building or the White House. Um, we have hymns, um, the National Anthem, God Bless America. Um, and we have a calendar, and we go through it every year to remember the American story with July 4th and Memorial Day and Veterans Day and President's Day and all of that. So we're being shaped into good citizens of the U.S. by all of those liturgical elements. Well, for centuries and centuries, the church has had colors to mark the seasons. Um, you know, um, we've had, um, uh, we have our hymns, we have our saints, uh, we have our sanctuaries, um, we, we, we have our scripture. And, and all of that is meant to do the same thing to us, to shape us into the kind of people who uh, will be citizens, as you put it already, of the kingdom and live that out in this world. So that's why it's so important. The theology helps to make sure our worship is faithful to this God, faithfully represents this God who is the triune God revealed in Christ. And so uh, we need the theology to make sure our liturgy is on track. But the liturgy also shapes our theology. Uh, Mark Knoll, a good friend and church historian, um, once said that m more theology has been learned by evangelicals through the hymns that they have been singing through this through the, the decades than anything else that's gone on in the church service. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of wisdom to that, uh, to that statement. So, um, yeah, this, uh, this, uh, by the way, um, the liturgy has even shaped what we are as Christians and how we do it, uh, you know, our New Testament wasn't in its final shape until the mid fourth century. And how did that happen? Well, part of it was because the church led by the Holy Spirit discovered that it was, it was always reading these letters of Paul. It was always using these gospels because there were other gospels floating around and, and the Holy Spirit led the church to say, all right, this is your New Testament now. And that took three and a half centuries. Mm 
The doctrine of the Trinity, which is implied in Scripture, needed to be fleshed out more specifically, and that took three centuries mm-hmm. as the Spirit led the church. So, um, so it works both ways. The liturgy has shaped our, um, our, our foundational theology, but at the same time, the theology makes sure that our worship you know, faithfully represents this God that we um, say is revealed in Christ. Yeah. yeah, that's um I think that's such an important thing for people to recognize. In fact, we've been talking about doing a podcast on it um uh, soon. It's just that that idea that you just said, right? Cuz a lot of people don't know that the Bible, the New Testament didn't come into its final form until, you know, 4th century. A lot of people still think it's sort of just even though they would say it didn't, but then if you ask them well, then how did we get scripture they wouldn't really have a good answer for you yeah, it was mm-hmm. like jesus died he rose he ascended and then all of a sudden yeah. boom 27 books oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he handed paul the king james right and <laughs> yeah. so he was ready to go <laughs> um but that's not how it happened and so you know a lot of times when people really you know like i'm sure some people have made that might be the first time that they're hearing wait wait what the bi- the, the first century uh second century third century christians didn't have a quote Bible the way that we have it right now, and that can be challenging to their faith. And so um, I, I would just simply say this is why studying the Bible and studying theology and church history is so important because this should not be a challenge to your faith. In fact, I think it should aid in mm-hmm. your faith because that that it, it's an incredible way that God works and moves through our history and uh, if we don't learn it then I think we're depriving ourselves of a uh, a lot of testimony to what God has done uh through his church. We brag about God doing stuff in our lives. Mm-hmm. Well, he's also done stuff in our plural the church's life for 2000 years and we need to uh I think Absolutely. we need to be aware of that. I'm so glad you said that. Um um a uh, couple of things. One is most of the yous in the New Testament are plural in the Greek. They're talking about, you know, everyone together. Um, and secondly, um, yes, I've come to believe that the Holy Spirit has guided the church all these centuries. If not, then we have a dead God. We have an alive God who is now Scripture ensures the, if you will, in a sense, the purity of our doctrine, because we always have to test it against Scripture. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit uh, has led us to see more fully what is in Scripture. Um, I mean, I, you know, in some ways, Augustine probably knew a little bit more than the Apostle Paul did. I mean, Paul didn't even have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They weren't they weren't there yet. And <laughs> so yeah. they weren't written down yet. Um, and um, and and it's not it's not to discredit Paul's. I mean, Paul's theology is, is uh, central, uh, foundational to our faith. Um, but um, but but the Holy Spirit has continued to guide the church in this understanding of what God gave us uh, through these apostles, these disciples of Jesus, as they wrote these things down. So, mm-hmm. um, and I celebrate that. I think that's that's what that makes that makes the Christian life even more exciting, right? Yes, it does. And you, know, you, I, you talk about it, right? The Bible is a story about God, uh, the great drama, the meta narrative, and it didn't yeah. stop. You know, with the New Testament. Well, I mean, I guess it does if you count Revelation, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, there is, I don't want to get into this, man. We, we could go down a whole rabbit hole now. Now I want to start talking about biblical theology and the and the five, uh, the, the five stage story and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, you have to read the book to go into a little bit more depth than what we're Yeah, that we're again about comes here. out in the first chapter, and I'm just borrowing from a couple of guys, a couple of Canadians and N.T. Wright, both. Um, but, oh, I'm glad you mentioned that again. I... I've been thinking about this uh, during this time of unrest in the nation and also uh, the virus. I have to keep uh, reminding myself, remember what story you're in, Akholm. Remember what story you're in. I'm in the biblical story, right? And Mm -hmm. once we see that Genesis is connected to Revelation, that there are themes that run throughout the entire scriptures, uh, the covenant, uh, for instance, the kingdom and all of that, um, then, and, and, and then we're, we're smack dab somewhere as the book says, somewhere in the fifth act of six acts of the story, then um, I need to live my life as one that fits this story, right? And doesn't fit some other story. And that's really hard sometimes because I'm tempted to um, try to locate my life in some other story. But no, I'm in, I'm in this biblical story and I have to keep remembering that. Yeah. And we do that as church. <laughs> 
in this story. Which is so easy to do because we're so often caught up in either political arguments or other arguments that are swirling around in the culture right now that are so polarizing. We have to, we think we have to come down on one side or the other. There's no third option, not not in a third way or, or golden way kind of a gold. What's the word I'm trying to think of? You know what I'm saying? Like a, like a golden road or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we think we have to choose between the world's way uh, on, on this side or the world's way on this side. And we forget that we're in a totally separate kingdom. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard not to be forced into making a decision because it seems like if we're not making a decision, well, then we're just totally ignorant and foolish mm-hmm. and we're not willing to help people or we're not willing to be a part of the world around us. And um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, when I'm teaching my students about this business, about the story, and I want to help them to see its implication. Um, I tell them that, you know, if um, I said, well, so, so let's say you have a youth group meeting um, advertised. Um, and if you say, um, you know, we're, we're just going to study, um, I don't know, um, some doctor or something, you might get a few kids out. But if you say next week, we're going to talk about sexual relations, you're going to get a big group out, right? So, yeah. and sometimes those talks, um, tell the kids don't have uh, sexual relations before marriage because you'll get STDs or whatever. Well, that's that's going from fear. And I, I tell my students, the reason that one is faithful to just one person in marriage uh, in the sexual union uh, is based on the story we're in. Mm-hmm. We are in a story that goes through the Old Testament where Yahweh was the husband of Israel. And Israel went off, um, well, this is the Old Testament word, she went off being, being a whore. And uh, she committed adultery against her husband, uh, Yahweh. Um, and the book of Hosea is one of my favorites because it brings that out. Mm-hmm. And so why, why should I be faithful to one person? Because I'm in a story about a God who is faithful to Israel, even when she wasn't. And then you come into the New Testament, and Paul in Ephesians 5 says that Christ and the church is, um, and the metaphor for that, the analogy for that is a husband and wife relationship. And Christ is married to the church, so to speak, um, in the sense that God, Christ is faithful to the church. So I, I tell them that um, I think it's better to teach your kids um, that um, uh, that kind of relationship is lodged in this story of God's faithfulness to his people rather than, you know, do the common thing of, you know, you, you don't do this because you'll get pregnant or you'll get STDs. Of course, those are those can happen. But that's not the that's not the biblical understanding of why we're faithful to one person. The biblical understanding is because we're in a story of God's faithfulness to his people. Yeah. And that's. I think that's got to be my favorite thing about theology is that it starts getting at the why questions. Mm-hmm. And um, th- th- we love asking the why questions on the podcast. But and, and to me, again, if, if you're just simply saying, you know, it, it's a fear based thing or you get STDs. Well, we as human beings are really good with coming up with ways to mitigate those risks or to downplay them. Mm-hmm. And so, again, it's like uh, you, you don't want to get pregnant. OK, well, here's contraceptive. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like. But that's not really what our real ethic is about. We have to get deeper than that as, as Christians, and, and that's what you're talking about here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to transition just a little bit. I want to talk about, like, Josh, you, you brought it up with, with how our theology interacts with our culture today. And I, I do want to talk about postmodernism, um, mm-hmm. but maybe you hit on this point, I think it was in chapter three or so, where you were talking about how the church needs to be an alternative culture mm-hmm. rather than a counterculture. Because if we're counterculture, then we're still allowing our narrative, or, or we're still allowing the narrative to be driven by the world's culture. Mm-hmm. What do you mean then by, oh, to dig into that a little bit more, what, is, what are we supposed to be when we come to an alternative culture? Because this is one of those issues that, you know, I always struggle with, and I see lots of people struggle with, and and I think it here, here's a theology. <laughs> well, um, I, it goes all the way back to uh, Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture, where he mm-hmm. lays out five different ways for the church to interact with our culture, and a lot of times we end up saying Christ. Uh, we, we we land on way five of his. Christ should transform 
culture. Is that what you're talking about? Is that the church should transform the culture or is it really a distinct, different alternate culture? No, great question. Um, it's a large question. Um, yeah, but, sorry about that. <laughs> well, no, no, no. It's, a, it's, it's one of my favorites uh, in this sense. Um, um, so, and this is the way I would approach it, and I I hinted approaching it this way in the in the book. Um, um, though later in the book, I do suggest that there are different ways to talk about the church's relationship to the world. But um, the church, yes, right. If the church is countering the prevailing culture, then, as you mentioned, the prevailing culture is setting the agenda, and that's not what we need. We don't need to take our cues, even if we're against it from the from the cult, prevailing culture. But we need to be a culture that takes its cues from um, especially the teachings of Jesus Christ. And, um, and if we're focused in on those as church, then we begin to live out as community in a way that is, um, is an alternative in the sense that we're not taking our cues from anything other than uh, the one who is the head of the body, Jesus Christ. But as we live that alternative culture in the midst of the culture, you know, I see the bumper sticker, not of this world, and I, I bemoan the fact that they didn't include the rest of the verse. Mm -hmm. But in this world, um, Jesus said to Pilate, um, my, my disciples are not of this world. If they were, they would have fought mm -hmm. uh, on my behalf in this situation. What he meant was that he didn't mean that my, this, by being not of this world, that my disciples have nothing to do with this world. Um, what he meant was they don't operate according to the modus operandi of, of this prevailing culture. They live their lives according to a different uh, way of living that I have taught them. And so as we are in the world, as uh, well, Stanley Harawas puts it, resident aliens, we reside in the world. But we do so as aliens. We do so as people who, yeah, well, let's put it in terms of the King James Version translation of 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, uh, where the translation says that the church is a peculiar people. <laughs> We're, we look peculiar some ways to the world. Um, we forgive our enemies. We, we, pray for, we, we pray for those who persecute us. That's crazy. That's nuts. Um, we don't do that because we're against the way the prevailing culture um, deals with its enemies. We do it because, well, that's exactly what Jesus taught in Matthew 5 through 7, right? Um, so, again, part of my agenda in the beginning of the book, and, and you're right, uh, comes, I, I, I forget, second or third chapter, I forget too, I have to go back, what did I write? And, um, and <laughs> uh, but, but that's part of what guy, but welcomes us into this study of theology and worship is, okay, if this is who we are, then we got to get our thinking straight and the way that we worship straight, and those go together, so that we can be the kind of cultural community, namely church, that shows the world a different way to live, the way that Christ meant for us to live. And some people are going to be attracted to that, and some people are going to be put off by it. And Jesus promised that too, didn't he? I mean, his evangelistic message was terrible. He said, come follow me, and you'll lose your stuff. You may lose your family. You will lose your life. Um, mm -hmm. But the rewards are great, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, that's, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, because um, that's the way that I'm looking at it. Uh, as an alternative culture, we transform the culture. Mm -hmm. But we don't transform it in worldly ways. We transform it by simply, and you guys mentioned this word before, by simply being faithfully present in the world as the people of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So it's not, and I think this is this is how I'm going to get to uh, postmodernism is because I think yeah. we're really struggling with that today yeah. as to how we actually go about, um, in many ways, and, and this has a lot to do, and you detail all this out in the book. Um, we are struggling with a uh, United States of America that has been founded on many of these modern Judeo-Christian principles. And we, we as the church have had a lot of power in the United States for a long time and in the West in general. Mm -hmm. Well, all of that power starting to seep away from us as postmodernism post sorry, English is hard sometimes, comes in <laughs> and it erodes those values out of the culture that we once, they, they were just a given. 
We didn't have to convince anybody, you know, to put the Ten Commandments up there or anything like that. But now, you know, the way in which we go about trying to convince people and live in the world, we really do have to be peculiar. So when when it comes to transforming culture or being this alternative culture, I mean, are we trying to then go out in the world and say, wait a second, hey, you guys, you, you're you're going someplace you shouldn't be going, come back to, to, to this way? Or, and, and you point this out, maybe you can elaborate on this, why is postmodernism a potentially good thing for the church's witness? Yeah, so um, a, a, an influential book that I read years ago, I, I, I was teaching, um, I was it wasn't the course I wanted to teach, but I was assigned to teach at Azusa Pacific University uh, when I first got there, Apologetics. And um, uh, I subtitled the course Apologetics as if people matter. Um, and it wasn't just to be about arguments. Um, it was to be about um, how do we enter into a conversation in such a way that's winsome, uh, which we're taught to do in Scripture. Um, and along the way, um, one of the books I signed, read and assigned, and by the way, many of us professors assign books so we can read them. Um, so one of the reasons, uh, one of the books was um, Who's Afraid of Postmodernism by James K.A. Smith, um, a fellow that we've mentioned already. And Smith argues that, and he looks at three of the postmodern philosophers and argues that um, uh, yes, we admit there's kind of a very relativistic kind of postmodernism, and there is that. But the kind of postmodernism that came out of um, the, the people he's looking at, Foucault, Deodard, uh, Derrida, and, and um, uh, Leotard, that um, they were really focusing in part on the fact that all of us come at things from a perspective. Um, one of my mantras with my students is, there's no view from nowhere. There's no view from nowhere. Every one of us is looking at life from a perspective. In, in, in one sense, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but in one sense, there isn't objectivity. Um, we're all looking at life from the, the peculiar situation that we're in, whether it's our gender, our, our upbringing, um, our geographical location, our, our faith um, uh, commitments. Um, and so, uh, so what postmodernism in its best form forms teaches us is that that's right. Um, don't apologize for that. You're looking at life from a certain perspective. That's a given. Um, the question is, how do you go about trying to convince people that your perspective is the right perspective? If we're talking about, for instance, um, Christianity. Um, and so, um, so what I was trying to do in that apologetics class was helping students to learn how to enter into conversation with others who are looking at life from other perspectives and uh, finding strategies or ways of helping people to consider the perspective of, of uh, Jesus Christ. And, and that, again, is, is, is what's best about um, this, this postmodernism. I think what's happened in our culture recently, especially, um, is that people are... People are very confused right now because, um, you know, what's true and what's not, um, even in the popular culture or the political culture we've got now. And that makes it even more difficult, I think, for Christians to simply say, you know, from our perspective, Jesus Christ is the truth, the truth in life way. Um, and there is truth. Again, um, I can't prove it objectively. What I can prove it through is um persuasive um, arguments or strategies um, as we sit in conversation with other people. Yeah. And so that is one of the things I'm trying to bring out early in the book is, um, is, is that um, we've, we've just got to realize that if, if, if we try, the problem is um, that if we, if we try to win the case on the basis simply of rational arguments, and I'm not against rational thinking and rational arguments. But if we try to win the case simply on the basis of rational arguments, we're going to have to use at some point uh, criteria for winning that are not necessarily part of the Christian faith. They're part of more of the, you know, common, actually not post-modernity, but what we call modernity, uh, enlightenment thinking, actually, um, enlightenment criteria for what's rational. Yeah. Um, I tell my students, um, think about our founding document. We hold these truths to be divinely revealed in Scripture? No. We hold these truths to be self-evident that um, 
And if, unfortunately, at that time, they meant white men who own property are equal. <laughs> let me just face it, women didn't have the vote, let alone uh, mm-hmm. blacks considered uh, fully human beings. Um, and, um, and, and, and that was part of the Enlightenment project. Um, and the problem with that is, is that if you're going to have, if you're just going to accept things that are, quote unquote, self-evident to, quote unquote, rational people, you may end up discounting some things in the Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it, Thomas Jefferson did that. He cut out the miracles in the Gospels. He loved Jesus as a moral teacher. But, you know, rational people don't accept the fact that some guy gets up three days after he's been killed. Um, and so uh, we don't want to accept necessarily uh, what the world considers rationality. Um, some of our faith isn't rational according to worldly standards. Yeah. Some of it is... And it yeah. calls us to, it really does, it calls us to be faithful to the message that we profess, because now we can't just simply uh, assume it and then assume that everything that we do in our culture is privileged status, people of power. That was a good alliteration. Um, <laughs> it is the correct way uh, of living because it's self-evident. You know, it's one of those things, like the word common sense is, uh, you, you know, it, it, it Common Sense as a as a strong as a book and a philosophy um, by uh, I'm just lost his name John Locke um, right yeah. he wrote Common Sense yeah. I was yeah. right right yeah <laughs> you know holds a a, a strong philosophical uh, foundation stone for you know America's thinking but like I hate it when people use the term now because I'm like yeah there's no such thing as common sense we're not we don't share anything in common just about anymore you've got to flesh that out from your perspective and so. Um, yeah. I, I do I agree with you, and I think you're absolutely right that there's many good things that have come from and are coming from postmodernism. But I think we as Christians need to realize that that pain that we're feeling, it's coming, I think, from our power slipping away, and we're having to be more faithful then to our call in a world that's going to say, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why, why are you doing that? Why wouldn't yeah. you want to kill your enemy, right? Or why why wouldn't you want to uh, you know go out and just enjoy the pleasures of life w- wherever they might come from? Um, and we have to be ready with an answer. Well, we I- use we use the analogy of uh, playing a game on a field under a set of rules. Yeah. Like let's say let's say there's a group of people playing uh, football out on a field, American football, American football, and we come in. Uh, as as Christians, and we have a choice. We can play the game of football according to the game of football's rules, or we can come in with uh, the other sport. Play real football. <laughs> <laughs> real football. Let's say we're going to play, play soccer, and here we are, we're trying to, to play our game in the middle of the field, and it just, we look like complete fools because yeah. we're playing a totally different game, and everybody assumes we're playing American football, but we're not. <laughs> Yeah, and our goal is to try to convince people. No, you need to come play the real football. Yeah, and, and they they might ask questions like, "Well, well, how do I score points?" And and your job is to somehow make it reasonable that you're you're supposed to kick the ball through a tiny yep. goal rather than running it into the end zone. Yep, I love yeah, this but analogy. But you're playing a totally different game because we've got the we've got absurd. the language we've yeah. got the language issues. We got no 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 you sh- you shouldn't be touching the football. You should only be kicking it with your feet. And then when you score, you, know, you got one point. What are you talking about? I just got six points. And <laughs> like there's all the lots yeah. of miscommunication that's going on that I think is- I use that I use that analogy. That's a great analogy. I use that, and not only that, with, with science and religion, sometimes are operating according yeah. to different yeah. I just wanted to say you guys have just articulated uh, in different ways um, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 18 uh, to, to 25, well, actually on into chapter 2, verse 5. Yeah. Um, the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, right? Mm-hmm. And a stumbling block to the Jews in that context. But foolishness to the Greeks, because it doesn't make sense. Why would you worship uh, a man from human perspective, a man who was um, executed by the state for a crime he did not commit and assume that, as Paul says, that that's the dunamis, the power of God unto salvation. How can a state executed criminal be the power of God unto salvation? Doesn't make sense. But when you play by the rules uh, that God has established, um, it's the only way, as Paul says, to those who have faith to those who see the world rightly, 
it is the power of God into salvation. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But to but to others, um, it is foolishness. Yeah. yeah. And that's the kind of faith we live. Crazy, isn't it? So it is. It, it, it's crazy. <laughs> um, but I love it. What uh, final two questions? This is going to be a two for one question. Um, who is your book? learning theology through the church's worship for, and what do you hope they get out of it when they read it? Good questions. Um, So it's dedicated to my two granddaughters um, who right now are seven and nine um, in part because um, I tell my students, my goal is not to get you to own your own faith. My goal is to get you to embrace the church's faith. To, to embrace the faith that has been given to you faithfully down through the centuries, and then to pass it on, maybe even a little bit better than you found it. So uh, it's written to people in the church, and I truly mean that. I think this book is uh, completely accessible to educated people in churches, um, and in other words, people who really want to learn uh, in churches. And I also wrote it for my co- Christian college students who need to learn the faith to pass it on. My um, I have a, um, a goal in life, and it's to fill the pews and the pulpits with biblically and theologically literate people. Um, so I just want to hand the faith down to um, to those who are living now and so that they can hand it down faithfully to the next generation. Uh, and ultimately, um, I teach. Um, I My vocation is to serve the church of Jesus Christ. It is God's it is God's alternative to the prevailing culture, and it is God's. In 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul says, don't you, plural, know that you, plural, all of you, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And in other words, we are God's option to the world. We are God's option to the, to the, to the fallen world. So that's what I hope my book does. I hope it, it uh, helps um, the church and the next generation as well. And I would just like to echo that this book, it's an introduction to theology, but it is extremely accessible. So I, I, I think you're exactly right. If you are any person in the church who you know, can read and you're interested in learning, this is a great place to start. If you've ever tried to read other systematic theologies, n- number one, yeah. this is like 200 pages. It's not four or 500 pages. It, it is a right. good introduction, and I, and I would highly, highly recommend this, uh, this book to people. Um, where can people go to get a copy of your book and to uh, follow the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's on Amazon, um, and um, so completely accessible through Amazon. Uh, Baker uh, published it, and that's one of the leading evangelical uh, publishers. Um, and um, yeah, there's a couple of other books on there, too, um, about early monastics uh, teaching us psychology, the one you mentioned, Dangerous mm-hmm. Passions, Deadly Sins, and the one that uh, just got made into an audiobook, will be up soon as an audiobook uh, by a friend of mine, um, Monk Habits for Everyday People. Uh, if anybody wants to learn about how early monks can help us in our spirituality, um, in our, in our disciplines, uh, in the Christian faith. Yes. So, yeah. That's great. And we, we, we were going to have to have you back on because there was a whole list of questions I wanted to talk about how you go from writing mostly, you know, about the monastics and then you transition into this. And <laughs> I wanted to also ask you about, um, your, uh, you've changed churches a couple times, traditions, and so I wanted to ask you theologically how you, you came and thought about some of those things. But anyway, um, you guys will have to definitely go uh, check out Dr. Occam's books. They're wonderful. They change your life. And I, I, think you, I think it's really well said what you said, you know, uh, learn the faith uh, to pass it on. I think that's exactly what your books do. So thank you for that so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. How can you create a lifestyle of discipleship? Most Christians think discipleship is a program or a few practices thrown in at the beginning or end of the day. But we want to help you create a lifestyle where walking with Jesus throughout the day is not only possible, but natural. And we have a tool that's going to help you do just that. It's called the Daily Growth Journal. It's a guided journal that's going to help you become secure in your identity with God and authentically walk with Him in your daily life. Growing daily in your walk with Christ is possible if you cultivate a lifestyle of discipleship. And the Daily Growth Journal will help you do just that.
listening to this episode of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. To find out more about Dennis's work, check out the links in the show notes below or check out his book, Learning Theology Through the Church's Worship. If you like what you've heard this week, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast player you use. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to stay up to date on everything happening at Daily Growth Discipleship, go to dailygrowthdiscipleship.com and subscribe for free. You can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Spotify.